Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. I'm your host, Kristen Hawkins. I am very excited about today's uh, conversation we're going to have. As you know, we're in season three, having difficult conversations. And today we're going to talk about vaccines. We're going to talk about fetal stem cells, and we're especially going to talk about the COVID vaccine and what we should do and how we should behave as pro-lifers. And I know this is a big question, and there's a lot of diverging opinions out there. So hopefully uh, today we can provide some information, some facts for you to really consider when you're thinking about vaccinations and whether or not you're going to vaccinate your children and how you're going to talk about vaccinations in the public arena. So joining me today on the podcast, I actually have two guests, not one. Um, and I'm really excited because both Dr. Tara Sander Lee and Dr. David Prentice serve in leadership at the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Uh, Dr. Lee is a senior fellow and the director of life sciences there at Charlotte Lozier and Dr. Prentice is the vice president and research director there at Charlotte Lozier. If you all haven't heard about Charlotte Lozier, they are a part of the Susan B. Anthony list. They're an organization that is dedicated to policies and practices that protect the sanctity of human life. So often, you know, if there is a congressional hearing and it involves abortion, you're probably going to be hearing from uh, a pro-lifer testifying who's associated with the Charlotte Lozier Institute or uh, the congressmen or senators will reference a Charlotte Charlotte Lozier Institute study. Um, think of them as a much better Guttmacher Institute. You know how the other side of, you know, the abortion lobby has the Guttmacher Institute, named for the second president of Planned Parenthood, who was a eugenicist, by the way. The Charlotte Lozier Institute is like our institute on the pro-life side, the good guys. So uh, Dr. Lee, thank you for joining us. You've got a ton of experience. You have a PhD in biochemistry from um, Medical College of Wisconsin. You had fellowship training at Harvard Med and Boston Children's. Thank you so much for joining me today. And Dr. Prentice, uh, thank you for joining me. I've known you for a long time. Uh, you served at the Family Research Council. You were appointed just this, this year by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to serve on the Federal Human Fetal Tissue Ethics Advisory Board. You are probably the leading person when it comes to ethical fetal stem cell research. You know everything there is to know about stem cells uh, and fetal stem cells. The first question I have for you is, are there current vaccines in use that were derived using fetal stem cells. And can you explain just briefly what it means when someone says a, a vaccine was derived from fetal stem cells and why that's bad? Well, the short answer, Kristen, is yes. There are still some vaccines that are made using abortion-derived stem cells, fetal stem cells, cells that came from an abortion. It may have been years, may have been decades, but mm. you can still trace that ethical line back to that original abortion, the death of a young human being. The number's going down, thankfully, but there are currently nine out of the total 58 viral vaccines that use abortion-derived cell lines. So, for example, the, the chickenpox vaccine, uh, the... Uh, old shingles vaccine. There's a new one that doesn't. So again, mm -hmm. an advanced uh, using an ethically derived cell line. Uh, some others like hepatitis A, the R in MMR, so rubella, that part of that mixture is made. And again, it's only a total of nine, but they still are using these older fetal cell lines for production of those vaccines. So when you say that these are older vaccines, um, how did these aborted children come to be used in, in, in these vaccines? And what does it mean when you're saying it's, it's been years? So like, it's not, it, it, are these not taken from children who are aborted like last month? These, right. these are being derived from abortion, aborted children year, decades ago? Like, how does that happen? So right. I, and it's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, I, yeah, I just wanted to explain that that's a really important distinction to make, Kristen. So thank you for bringing that up, because these cell lines that are used um, that were derived from an abortion occurred decades ago. OK, so they occurred um, for some of them, they occurred back in the 60s or the 70s. So it was from one abortion and they actually took a cell from the aborted fetus and then they expanded it and and multiplied it in the laboratory. And then those cell lines are what are used to actually produce and make the vaccines, okay? And they can be frozen down, they can be thawed back out years later and then expanded to make more vaccines, but it does not require the ongoing destruction of these babies because these cell lines can be propagated over and over and over again without any more destruction. So hopefully that helps to explain okay. So it's they're taken from one child who's been aborted, uh, and then they then they just multiply that cell and they grow those lines from that child. Right. Why why did they start doing that? Why didn't they just use animal? Like why why babies? Well, it, back in those years, this was some of the first years of cell culture as a science. Okay. And at that point in time, a lot of the scientists thought, oh. The younger the tissue that you take these cells from, the better. They will last longer. They can keep them growing longer and do more experiments. And so they went to the youngest they could get, aborted babies. And, you know, as Tara has said, there aren't very many of these. And it's like from only one cell line comes mm -hmm. from one abortion years ago. So there's a lineage, you might say. Mm -hmm. Uh, but people just kind of have gotten used to using those cells in a lot of different things. And we see that even today, there are only about four of these cell lines that are used for viral vaccine production. But some scientists have gotten used to using that particular cell. Maybe it's that's what they learned when they were a graduate student, or maybe it's convenience. They just happen to have those cells in the freezer or, you know, they've read all these things about cells and using them, but it's always been about that particular type of cell. And, and I think in a lot of cases, they really have no clue about the origin of the cell. I, we have a, a colleague who actually had done some experiments and then started investigating and to his horror discovered, because he's a solid pro-lifer, discovered that this one cell had come from an abortion, again, decades ago. So he mm -hmm. stopped using it, number one, and actually yeah. published a little thing in his scientific paper encouraging other scientists to swear off using those old cell lines. Yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, it seems like it, it's, it almost just seems like laziness from the scientists. Like there's ethnic ethical alternatives that we now know, I mean, you said majority of the viral vaccines now no longer use fetal stem cells, but it's just kind of easier because this is how it was always done. Therefore, why would I try anything yeah. different? Um, but I mean, when we think about so much of so many of our social justice causes today, like for yes, you know, recycling takes a little bit extra time to figure out how you're going to do it. But once you do it, it just becomes standard. And you're like, why didn't I recycle from the beginning and I can feel good about the my waste and how I'm being a responsible citizen. So, okay. So, so there's nine cells. These are not fresh abortions. These are, these are not abortions that are recent. These are abortions that took place years ago. What is, um, are there ethical alternatives for pro-lifers as like a parent? Um, are there alternatives or are there, I mean, for me, I, in full disclosure, and this is where I'll get all the negative emails after this, I have vaccinated my children, and I'm very much pro-vaccination. I have two children with cystic fibrosis, as many of you all know. Like that, you know, get, getting measles, getting rubella, like these are things that I just do not, I cannot chance it with my children. Um, so I've always been pro-vaccination, and, and the way I have personally kind of thought about it is obviously I'm against uh, I'm against using children for medical research to create these vaccines. Um, but if there is no alternative available to me, um, I, I feel that I'm not going to be held. I don't know. I feel like when I 
get to the pearly grates, I, I will not be held morally culpable for va- choosing to vaccinate my children uh, with the rubella vaccine. Um, and I think it's different for everybody. But are there alternatives for pro-lifers to use other ones for these nine that you mentioned? So for some of them, there are, and for others, there are not. So for example, I mean, I have a, a, a young child and when it came time to vaccinate him, um, you know, and I'm in this field every day, right? And, and, even, and it just becomes a very difficult decision to make yeah. when you're looking at this list of vaccines and you're, the, the pediatrician is telling you, okay, it's time for your child <laughs> to get the chickenpox vaccine, the MMR, and you know that, you know, mm-hmm. the, the MMR vaccine, there is no alternative option. The chickenpox, there is no alternative option. Um, and this becomes a very difficult decision. For some, like the Shingrix vaccine, right, there there actually is an alternative now available that doesn't use fetal cell lines, and it actually even works better than the older ones, the older one that was made during fetal cell lines. So this does become, it puts parents in a really difficult yeah. position, it puts families in a very difficult position, and for, for me personally, I used it as an opportunity to educate the pediatrician and say, you know, and say, I want the alternative, it's available. But Mm -hmm. like I said, for some of those, there weren't, there was no alternative, like the chicken pox and the MMR. But use that as an opportunity to educate. Um, And in the end, I ended up vaccinating my child as well. um, Because I, I, I knew that there was no alternative. But then I use it as an opportunity to teach. And, um, and then we have to call out these manufacturers, too, and say, you know, um, the, for those that have chosen to continue to use these cell lines, even though they don't need to, call them out and say, you know, look, look, there are other alternatives. Mm-hmm. Um, and then applaud those manufacturers that have. And, and, and there are and there are many. And, you know, Shingles was just the one that I mentioned. Um, and so I think that's it's really becomes an opportunity. And I do believe that now in, in the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic, this is an excellent opportunity mm-hmm. to educate and create awareness for everybody involved. Wasn't there just uh, a polio? I feel like Charlotte Lozier, you all uh, authored a letter recently. I think I signed on uh, pro-life leaders kind of thanking one of the makers of the vaccines for stopping use of the fetal stem cells. Yeah, Sanofi uh, had been making their polio vaccine in one of these fetal cell lines for years. And finally stopped and switched to an ethically derived line. Actually, it was an animal cell line, which there's not really an ethical problem there. And it's moving them away, though, from this reliance on these old ethically challenged, ethically tainted, however you want to express it, uh, methods and materials and so on. So I do think it's important that we celebrate and congratulate those who've moved away and like like Tara's saying, uh, also educate people about this because a lot of physicians, a lot of parents don't know the origin mm-hmm. and how those vaccines were made and, and so on, and hold these manufacturers accountable. So since you, you're an adjunct professor at the John Paul II Institute, Dr. Prentice, at mm-hmm. CUA, Catholic University, okay. um, what does the Catholic Church say about vaccines and what what a good Christian is, is supposed to do. I mean, I think what Dr. Lee was kind of saying is you use it as opportunity. Like, I know I certainly educated yeah. my pediatrician and his whole entire staff about vaccines uh, when it came time for my children. So I was asking these questions of, are there alternatives? Which of these were derived from um, aborted children? And they were like, what are you talking about? So then I had to go, you know, Google and bring it up on my phone and say, read this. Um, so I did use it as opportunity to educate. I think it's because I have vaccinated my children, knowing that, you know, they received the, the chicken pox and their Bella vac- vaccine, I feel morally like I have to speak out against these manufacturers and, and mm-hmm. do just what Dr. Lee was saying. We, I have to c- call them to change um, because I, you know, I, I feel like I have that moral culpability. But what does the church say and what's kind of the ruling that comes down from the church on this? But actually, we should all be speaking out, yeah. whether whether you've you've used the vaccines or not. We should all be 
trying to impress on them the need to move away. Now, the the Vatican put out a statement in 2005, uh, a little more detail in Dignitas Personae in 2008, and actually just put out another statement. And and there's sort of different things to look at. So again, this is this is what's coming from the Vatican. Obviously, the first thing is you'd prefer to to make use of a vaccine that has no connection whatsoever. The ethical alternative that we're all trying to find. And the good news is that in most cases, those are there, but there are some Mm -hmm. where that's not present. And this applies whether we're talking about uh, current licensed vaccines like we've been discussing or the the COVID-19 vaccines that are being developed. The point is still that first you're trying to find one that is produced ethically, that has no connection there. What if you don't have one of those? Well, then it's a question of uh, kind of a risk-benefit analysis, if you will. If there's a grave reason, serious reason to make use of one of these vaccines, well, you know, preventing death, preventing serious illness does qualify as a grave reason. What the Vatican has said is then you can licitly take one of those vaccines. But there's a a second part to that, and it's the one that you've already mentioned. You Mm -hmm. should be educating. You should be advocating. You should be pushing the manufacturers, your doctors, people in authority and government that we need an ethical alternative. There is also, uh, it becomes a matter of personal choice and and weighing these and how concerned are you with the connection that they've also said that you should not feel bad if you don't make Mm -hmm. use of the vaccine. Again, it's a matter of each person for themselves, their family and their community need to consider the responsibility to each other and to themselves and to them, their family in terms of making use of these. So, you know, that's they've got a very, uh, I think, well thought out paradigm. People, other people may use others. But, mm-hmm. you know, again, you're first trying to find one that doesn't have any connection. Mm-hmm. And hopefully there are those. Yep. If there's not that, then, you know, you can go ahead for a grave reason and make mm-hmm. use, but we're all supposed to be advocating for the ethical alternatives. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know if this helps you all who are watching and listening to this, but just the decision-making process. So a couple of years ago when Obamacare was handed down and, you know, um, it was mandated, the Department of Health and Human Services labeled pregnancy a preventable disease, it was mandated that all insurance companies have to cover abortive patient contraceptives uh, 100% in their health care plans. Not, not just barrier method contraceptives like condoms, but, but, you know, birth control pill, Depo-Provera, which we know can potentially cause an early abortion. We don't know the rate, but we know the potential is there. Um, and so one of the things I struggled with as someone who runs a business and with 50 employees was, what do we do with our health care plans? I have supporters who donate to Students for Life, who then I take that money and pay uh, payroll and pay it in health care benefits to my employees. And then, you know, the state of Virginia, and it's run by Democrats now, the state of Virginia went full on. Um, and so, you know, now all the health care plans in the state of Virginia cover abortive patient contraceptives. And I really struggled with, you know, I have supporter money that's being used to pay for health care plans. I'm a pro-life anti-abortion group that's now having to purchase a health care plan that covers potentially abortive patient drugs. And so I met with a couple of different ethicists. I met with a priest, you know, trying to figure out how do I, as an employer, am I held morally responsible for this? Um, and also someone who's stewarding, you know, yeah. donations coming into our organization. And I think just a, just exactly what you described is kind of the way I was kind of advised to go about it of I'm seeking constantly seeking out different health care plans. In fact, now I offer a standard health care plan for people like my family who have, you know, advanced, complex, expensive medical needs. But then I also offer a Christian health sharing plan. Um, so I offer two different plans to our employees. I'm doing it under kind of duress, under protest, but I realize it's also 
I also have a moral responsibility as an employer to provide health care for my employees, to take care of my employees and their families, and to make sure they don't get into a situation where they can't pay for the medical care that they need. And so I, I, I would advise you, if you're thinking about this, this vaccine issue, what Dr. Prentice laid out, and I think what's kind of the Vatican, it's been communicated from the Vatican, regardless of whether or not you're Catholic or not, I think it's some good advice of, are you doing it under kind of duress, you know, wishing that you had an alternative? Are, are you speaking out? Are you using it as an, you know, as Dr. Lee said, as an opportunity to educate others? Um, I, I think that might help you when you're making your decision about how you feel about vaccinations. And when you start having children, I know we have many students who listen in who aren't at the having children stage yet, uh, but will be very soon. And these are these are issues that you will have to wrestle, wrestle with as a parent. Um, all right, so vaccines, we know there's some, nine of them are still using unethical fetal stem cells. Um, we know there are some alternatives, but not always. I want to talk about the COVID vaccine. Um, but before I do that, because that's I kind of want to end on that, because that's kind of the breaking news that we need to talk about. And the vice president just took the vaccine, Vice President Pence, who's, you know, the pro-life champion, the most pro-life politician that's ever, you know, been elected to public office, I would say. I can't wait for him to run for president. I'm taking a leave of absence to serve <laughs> for him. Um I've already told, told our team, but um, what else do we need to be looking at? Because I came across an article um, just the other day about the st fetal stem cells where they're not just talking about vaccines and using these fetal stem cells. The at University of Pittsburgh, I live in Pittsburgh, they're using, they're using organs and body parts of children who are being aborted in Pittsburgh for humanized mice is that right can you explain what else is going on here that we need to be aware of yeah so you know right up to this point we've been talking about fetal cell lines which is is different and distinct from fetal tissue mm -hmm. but what you're talking about now is the trafficking uh, a trafficking of fetal body parts from ongoing abortions mm -hmm. so these are abortions that just happened recently. And uh, immediately after these babies die, they harvest them for their organs and their body parts, and then they're trafficked. And they go to researchers' laboratories for experiments such as humanized mice, like you talked about. So these are mice that are used in the laboratory to perform exper experiments. They're called humanized mice because they use human tissue in order to make the give the mouse basically a human immune system so that they can then study different diseases and infections and test different um, therapeutics. And so, for example, like they've been used to study HIV, um, tuberculosis. And so and so this is where we get into, you know, the ongoing abortions is are required to make these humanized mice because once you perform the experiment, you need more tissue to make more mice. You can't, you know, just, and so it is, it's, it's a horrible practice. Um, and th this is, this is what we want. We want all, we want all research using fetal cell lines and human tissues to stop. Um, mm -hmm. But when we start looking at federal funding that is used to purchase these tissues and keep the research going, that's where President Trump and HHS made a strong mm -hmm. stance in stopping the money uh, given to researchers to prevent more of this research um, to continue. So I don't know if David wants to add anything more to that. I mean, they, uh, President Trump's administration actually shut down quite a bit of that trafficking, at least took away a lot of the federal taxpayer funds, mm -hmm. uh, set up this uh, federal ethics advisory board to look at some of the grants that were going out to universities like the University of Pittsburgh and other places where they were doing this, uh, and also shut down a bunch more of that, and then also switched some of those funds instead of going to aborted fetal tissue, moved $20 million to start looking at alternatives, other ways to do that. And, and there are plenty of other ways to make the humanized mice or to do these types of experiments. Uh, and, and again, just like we've seen for the vaccines, 
it turns out they're better as mm-hmm. well. They're more clinically relevant and so on. And it's, it's just trying to gently or sometimes even vigorously, we could say, nudge the scientist to go to modern techniques, better, better accuracy, certainly more clinically relevant and ethical. Yeah, I mean, I find it fascinating that, one, this is why you need to vote pro-life first. So, you know, what we're going to see with the onslaught of a Biden-Harris administration is instantly they're going to be lobbied to refund all of these uh, universities that are buying children and their body parts from abortionists and conducting research on them. And this is like stuff that happens at the bureaucratic level. It doesn't make headlines, but this is why having a pro-life president matters because the president appoints the personnel who run the bureau- bureaucracies who mm-hmm. then make these, these decisions that never get on the nightly news. So when someone tells you it doesn't matter whether or not we have a pro-life president, tell them they're smoking crack that is not right. Listen to this podcast. That drives me insane. Sorry, that's the side issue. But what we found with when, when David Delayden and the Center for Medical Progress released their undercover study in 2015 of the Planned Parenthood workers, you know, haggling over the price of the thymus and the liver and the body parts. First, we heard these are edited films. These are inaccurate. These are spliced. Then we heard. Then they switched and said. Well, we are con- we are a part of life, you know, life affirming research that our research is saving people from HIV and just what you mentioned that they're using these humanized mice and other things to watch viruses and, and figure out what medicines work. Um, so then they, so they, they stopped saying they were inaccurate. Then they started making this case in the public square that really they're just doing a good. This is a service that they're providing to the world by killing these children and then providing their body parts um, for research. And we found out the University of uh, UCSF, so University of California, San Francisco, they're like one of like the worst they're delaying abortions, trying to purposely delay abortions, and they're actually delivering some of these babies still with hearts beating because they need the right. freshest organs available. So, I mean, this is like happening. You know, when we talk about the vaccines, it's almost like that's that's that was decades ago that abortion happened. But when we're talking about human fetal tissue research that's happening today, these are abortions that are happening today Mm -hmm. and tomorrow yeah that's exactly right and it is it's um it's horrible and 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 what we've what we're really trying to help people understand is that there is absolutely no need for this tissue there is no therapy there is no uh vaccine there is no disease that absolutely needs these tissues in order to do good scientific research and Mm -hmm. There are so many alternatives. I mean, just as Dr. Prentice was mentioning earlier, I mean, even if we just look at the humanized mice, there are multiple, numerous uh, publications from very established, well-educated scientists that show over and over again that you can make really good, excellent, even better humanized mice using uh, human cord blood. So the stem cells from human cord blood from a natural delivery that was donated ethically, that the mother gave consent and, you know, it didn't bring harm to anyone. And so, and it showed, you know, it's the, it, it really, um, th- this is what we, that we need to really explain mm-hmm. to people and help them understand that we don't even need these <laughs> tissues why? at all. So yeah. Why? Why didn't they go? Th- why do they do that then? Is it just laziness? Is it cheaper or easier just to pay off the abortionists than to ask women to donate their umbilical cord blood? Uh, in many cases, yes, it actually is easier. So I can tell you from my own research when I was in a, in a lab, we were looking at uh, studying heart development in mm-hmm. babies, okay? There, it would have been much easier for me to pick up the phone or to get on the computer and say, please send me the hearts from, you know, an aborted baby. And so I can study these. It would have been easier. But instead, what we decided to do is actually when these brand new babies would actually go in for congenital heart surgery, mm-hmm. they would actually have to discard some of the heart. And, and that would be 
naturally discarded as part of the surgery. And so we did have to go through like an IRB process and, you know, work with the surgeon. So we were sitting there waiting for um, that tissue immediately after the surgery occurred. And there were more steps. Um, but at the end of the day, it was worth it because you're not, you know, putting uh, your your you're you're giving dignity and yeah. and respecting the sanctity of life for these babies because it's just it keeps the process going it and um it yeah it's just it's it's horrible what they're doing so yeah it's it's basic laziness of that we're hearing and i think what you just said dr lee was so important that there's there's no disease there's no vaccine is vaccine where it is a hundred percent absolutely critical that you kill a human baby for that there are every single vaccine research technique, there is an ethical way to derive um, ethical human stem cells as opposed to ending a human life. Dr. Prentice, you've said this over the years, and I don't know if this has changed or not, um, but there have been several cures, um, you know, significant um, medical advancements because of stem cell therapy. Have those been coming from these embryonic human cells or have they been coming from umbilical cord blood, adult stem cells? It's totally due to adult stem cells, Kristen. I mean, we used to have a little scoreboard and then it was hard to keep track after a while of all of the great successes with mm -hmm. adult stem cells. But embryonic stem cells, the score is zero. Fetal tissue, the score is zero. In fact, the, the, the current um, statute about fetal tissue research was put in back in the 90s, basically phrased to do transplants because at that point in time, they had all these great ideas that they were going to transplant, again, young tissue yeah. mm -hmm. from aborted babies, and it would cure all of these things. I had one, uh, one senator tell me it had the potential to cure all known maladies. Anyway, uh, how many diseases have actually been not cured, but even improved the health mm -hmm. using aborted fetal tissue? Zero. That's and significant because what you just said, you read, repeat that because if you hear that on the nightly news and if this is being discussed yeah. in the news media, they act like, you know, embryonic stem mm -hmm. cells have been like this revolutionary thing for science. But you're saying zero. Zero, Zero, nada, none, nobody. Versus, uh, again, it's hard to keep track. Somewhere over 2 million people around the world have been successfully treated with adult stem cells, cells from umbilical cord blood, bone marrow, even liposuction fat, Chris. That's, uh, I can be a donor. For yeah, that I'll one. say, but, when, when but, can I know, sign again, up for that donation? Yeah, but it, it's totally <laughs> due to the ethical science and they're coming up with great things and great treatments but it's all adult stem cells not fetal not embryonic that's unbelievable because you never ever hear what you just said yeah. we need to get you on like every single nightly <laughs> news program to talk because that that's unbelievable now quite personal question the three hundred dollars i pay a year to save my children's umbilical stem cells is that a smart investment or should i let that lapse it's probably good i mean i you hear different things the the idea though that they've been saved period is is the main point and mm -hmm. some people will donate them to a public bank some people have like you what's called a, the family bank where you kind of mm -hmm. keep it more for your own family the point is to save it save okay. it somehow because Again, you're seeing almost every day yeah. new discoveries, new ways to fight disease, to treat people with various diseases. But again, it's all from these adult, and I, I include the umbilical cord blood stem cells and the solid part of the cord. We've got yep. a, a stem cell Thank center uh, at, in Kansas uh, signed into law by then Governor Brownback, mm -hmm. another very pro-life politician. Right. I want to put his I should name add, in should consideration. Add yeah, he gets up on the list. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, what they found is that they can take adult stem cells from the solid part of the cord and use those to treat lots of different conditions and potentially even to treat 
severe COVID-19. So that's still a work in progress, but the idea that you could use adult stem cells for so many different things successfully mm -hmm. and without causing the death of any human being. Wow. I'm going to make the team take this entire podcast and make it into multiple video clips. They always tell me I can only do one clip, but like everything, everyone needs to know. Um, and for yeah. the lazy people who don't want to hit subscribe, they need to see it on Facebook. I don't care. Okay. So <laughs> you just mentioned COVID-19. Let's talk about this vaccine because there's a lot going on and every, I've been avoiding social media pretty much since before the election. And every time I get on now, I like regret it because instantly there's all kinds of arguments happening. Yeah. What are your thoughts, one, on just like how quickly this vaccine was developed? Is it safe? I mean, now I heard from Kamala Harris, you know, during the presidential election that she wouldn't trust a vaccine that would come out this quickly. But now she's like all about it because she's the presumed vice presidential uh, person. Um, what what are your thoughts on is this safe? Like what's the history of vaccination development being done this fast? So you can actually look at the, scientifically, you can look at the methods that they're using to make these COVID-19 vaccines, and the speed can be explained in part just from the methods and the approaches being used. Um, so for example, you know, prior to COVID-19, there were, there were not, one of the traditional ways to make a vaccine was what's called a live attenuated or inactivated vaccine. And so sometimes this could take years, sometimes decades, right, to make a vaccine. But now with COVID-19, there's some newer and more advanced technologies, such as when we look at the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines that now have been FDA approved for emergency use, they are using this new approach called the mRNA vaccine. So they are they can synthesize this mRNA, which and M, the M stands for messenger. So it's messenger RNA, and you can think of that like um, it's like a, a recipe, right? It's going to be a recipe for how to make the protein, the vaccine, once you are vaccinated. And so this new method is incredibly fast because first, you don't need cell lines to make this vaccine to begin with. You can actually design it on a computer and then you can synthesize it in the laboratory. And then that's what gets injected into the individual. And so all you need to start this process is the sequence to know what's the viral sequence. And once they knew that, once both Pfizer and Moderna knew that, I, immediately they could begin synthesizing this in the laboratory Within days, they were starting production. Within a couple of months, they were starting, you know, massive uh, efforts to start their clinical trials. They could have overlapping clinical trials without even knowing exactly how the um, vaccine was going to, you know, was going to actually work. Um, and because, and then they had so much financial support, right, from the government yeah. that this allowed them. And then, of course, competition doesn't hurt either, right? You have a lot of <laughs> a lot of hands in the pot, and you want to make sure that your great Once ideas. Once again, this is why capitalism is a good thing. Yes. Okay. Just just saying. <laughs> Off the side, yes. So, I mean, you it really is exciting. And um, and the FDA is reviewing these applications, is approving them no differently than they have for other vaccines. It's just that mm -hmm. the process has been able to move much quicker in part because of the methods. That's chosen. fascinating. So this was developed on a computer. I know with CF research, they're doing the next generation. So my, my son and daughter are both on genetic modifiers, these really mm -hmm. expensive drugs. Gunner's in a clinical trial is one of 67 kids in the world. Wow. And we've seen, I mean, things that we never, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we're thinking that never would have been possible that now are going to be possible for in Gunner's lifetime, which is going to yeah. be, we believe, decades longer because of these genetic modifying drugs, which, by the way, you still can't get in countries with socialized health care because those countries are unwilling to pay the high price of these drugs. Um, because those drugs cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to make in research because they're considered orphan drugs because so few people can take them. But now the question is we've turned our sites in the CF community into, you know, into a full on cure because the drugs that Gunnar and Gracie are taking, they have basically restored um, function in the cells and they're making a lot of the cells operate normally, function normally, like not 
as if they don't even have CF, but it's not a full cure because if you stop taking the pill, you know, we don't, and we don't know what the long-term effects are, might be on other parts of the body because CF affects more than the lungs. Yeah. But now it's this RNA that you're talking about. That's, that's where they think yeah. this cure, and, and, curative effect will come into play. Right? And, and just one, one difference though, between the vaccine the mRNA vaccine and and what Gunner and these other kids are doing is the the treatments for these kids are designed so that they do change the DNA mm -hmm. within their cells because the the problem comes because you've got a, a faulty gene in mm -hmm. your cells it's mutated and so it doesn't function normally and so you've got to swap that old gene out for a good one is mm -hmm. one way to think about it but you're, you're purposely changing the DNA. Well, and, and we get this question a lot. Well, is that what the, the mRNA vaccines are doing? Are they going to change my DNA and change my RNA? And no, they're not. This is just the little recipe, like Tara talked about, for one particular protein. And it's the recipe. It's not the, it's not the recipe book, which the mm -hmm. DNA is. It's just a copy with one recipe that gets into our cells, and it doesn't change our DNA. It doesn't change our RNA. It kind of just gets into the queue with the other recipes, the other RNAs normally in our body. Our cell machinery reads that recipe and makes that virus protein and shows it to the immune system so that they make antibodies and they are prepared. That's, that's what a vaccine is all about. Mm -hmm. And then it discards that recipe. So it doesn't make any changes in our cells. It just gives another recipe for our cells to make, slips it in there, and the cell just goes on and makes all these different recipes, all these proteins, and there you go. Now you've got immunity against this virus, if it ever shows up. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I wish I had you in my pocket every time I go to a CF conference, so to explain this as easily as you're explaining it to me now. Um, now, What's so what's the drama about the vaccine? So now it's apparently safe. The Democrats will take it because Joe Biden was elected. So now apparently it's safe. I, ridiculous. Um, so the Democrats are taking it. I think Joe Biden took the shot right before the vaccine before Christmas. Mike Pence took it. I think he was the first kind of high ranking public official yeah. to take it live on TV. Um, but I still see sort of debate happening on Facebook where some of these vaccines for COVID derived from the embryonic stem cell aborted tissue lines? So if we look at the eight vaccines that are in operation warp speed, mm -hmm. some of them chose to use these fetal cell lines from past old abortions to make their vaccine. Okay. There actually are two that chose to that chose to use these fetal cell lines to make their vaccine, the AstraZeneca, the ones that were produced from AstraZeneca, and then the right. Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccines. I'm okay. writing this down now. So Johnson & Johnson, Astra AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca. Okay. Right. So those are the two manufacturers that chose to use the fetal cell lines. They didn't have to do that, but they chose to, okay, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, there are six in Operation Warp Speed that, that do not use any fetal cell lines at all to make their vaccine, or they chose to use an alternative, okay, okay like the animal or the insect. Um, so, but then there's, but if you look at, you know, how do you make a vaccine, right? So there's this issue of making, which was, we just talked about. That's what's actually going to be injected into your arm, all right? But then there are some of these vac manufacturers that chose to use fetal cell lines to test their vaccine. So this was post-production, separate from the manufacturing process. So it doesn't affect what's going to actually be injected into you, but they did use these cell lines to test, to do quality control tests on their vaccine. And so um, this just becomes, an, and so that's what, and I'll let David talk about that because he put together this amazing user-friendly chart that with different, um, different shapes and different colors to make it really <laughs> user friendly. So you can look and you can say, okay, which manufacturer actually, you know, chose to make their vaccine using these cell lines, which manufacturer actually chose to test. And it's a beautiful chart that gives it, makes a very easy and also another great chart you could give to your physician too. Yeah. Where uh, yeah. do I get said chart for myself? 
So you get it, get it at the Charlotte Lozier Institute website, which is lozierinstitute.org. And if you just go down the page a little bit, there's a, a lovely link that says what you need to know about COVID-19 vaccines. Oh. And so we've got a whole page with all these various things that Tara put together this great uh, document that tells you how vaccines are made because there used to be just one way. Now there are five. And, mm. and that's one of the things that confuses people. But it was also one of the reasons that warp speed could move so fast. We've got a we've got an abbreviated single page chart so you can just look and see, OK, of those eight warp speed vaccines, mm. which one did use fetal cells or not use fetal cells for production. So in other words, I'm making this thing and that's what's going to go into my arm. Or also this testing, because there's some people that, oh, there's still some connection there. And, and you know, it's a valid concern for some. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not what's going to be affecting me, but we'd still like to wean these companies and these yeah. scientists off of using any of those cells. We're looking forward to the day when they're not involved at all. They're just not used at all. But we're trying in full disclosure to make sure people have complete accurate information and then we do have a link uh, i think it's called update on covid 19 vaccines and fetal cells and it's this it's a geeky chart i admit it it's got all sorts of information about what phase they're in in testing and links to scientific articles and you know what you mainly want to look for is if there's a nice green square there okay uh, they did not use any fetal cells for that part of it, whether it's production or development or testing. If there's a red diamond, oh, that's they did use fetal cells for that. And then, like Tara was saying, some of these folks, they had already made the vaccine. They said, oh, let's test it and see if it works. Sometimes they did use fetal cell lines. Sometimes they didn't. So you've got a little red and green. It's really Christmassy in a way, but... Uh, you know, at least tells you that, you know, we wish they hadn't, but in some cases they did. In some cases they didn't do this post-production testing. Uh -huh. Our point is just people need to have complete, accurate information as they are thinking about, you know, yeah. is this something that I, I want to participate in? Yeah, and this is something I think that all of us as pro-lifers, we should get on, get onto the Lozier Institute website Get this document, share it on your social media. Green is go, good, red, bad, stop. Um, it's very simple. And I think, I mean, I was writing notes like, I got to send this out to all of our students for life leaders across the country, all of our supporters to say, hey, you need this is information that you're going to need in the coming weeks and months as you start talking about uh, vaccinations. Um, and hopefully some folks start getting in line for the vaccinations. Um, I guess one last question I would have um, for you is, what are your thoughts about, do you think this vaccination um, and others like the MMR should be mandatory? Um, or because there's ethical concerns, is that something that we should say, you know, we shouldn't be advocating for everyone to be vaccinated? I mean, we know we need vaccinations for immunity purposes. If people stop taking, I mean, this is why I know in Pittsburgh, for example, we had just last year a huge outbreak of measles here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was it was really concerning for us because, you know, there's questions about how effective are the vaccines. We haven't really put them to head to head tests sometimes. Um, and so we were like, uh, keep our kids away from everyone. Um, just in case their vaccine wasn't wasn't going to be uh, effective enough, um, it becomes concerning. So, what do you think? I guess from an ethical perspective, you know, can we be should we be requiring these vaccines, especially with COVID, be mandatory? Like, I would like to get back to life as normal as much as possible. But, um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and uh, I really don't like the idea of mandates at all, whether we're talking about vaccines or anything else. People people need to have choices. People need to have uh, the ability to exercise their free will. Now, and, and some people are gonna say, no, I, I just don't wanna take that vaccine. So I, I, I really have concerns and problems about this idea of a mandate. It really does need to be a matter of every person for themselves, their family, their community, needs to look at all of the information. That's why it's so important to have something like our nice geeky chart. So you've got all of that material there. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And then you're in discussion with your family, with mm -hmm. with your priest and your pastor, with your your colleagues and your friends. Talk about, you know, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should I go ahead and do it? We have a responsibility to our community. And, and so we need to consider that in there. And if if somebody decides that, yes, they're going to go ahead and accept that vaccine. Great. Uh, I think that contributes to eventually, you know, getting us back to some kind of normal, whatever that might be. And if somebody decides, you know, I just can't, I just can't see taking that vaccine. Great. I, I think there are maybe some extra responsibilities on you to make sure you shield your family and your community if you're not going to have the immunity. But I, I think that needs to be a choice made by every person individually and not mandated. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a question we hear sometimes, um, especially in the social media kind of chatter is like, well, if you're really pro-life, why aren't you pro-vaccination? Um, you know, and, and I, I, you know, it's one of those things that the people who advocate for violence against children like to lecture us on what pro-life really means. And for them, pro-life means you're against all these things except you're for abortion. So I, I think, you know, don't don't let yourself get backed into that corner and that debate you know, when you hear have someone who's advocates for abortion try to tell you what pro-life really means. And I think that's why we always talk about students for life, keeping it very simple what pro-life means, not expanding pro-life to mean, you know, 50, 50 things, but keeping it very small and talking yeah. about this is an anti-abortion movement. We're against anything that, you know, kills human, innocent human beings um, and, and keeping that scope of definition very small for what pro-life is. Because once you start expanding it, you can, you'll start getting into these questions. Well, is pro-life pro-vaccination? Is it anti-capital punishment? And we can certainly be pro-vaccination, anti-capital punishment, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it means in, of essence to be pro-life. And so it's a continual thing that we hear a lot. Um, and I know students hear a lot on campuses when people who advocate for abortion want to lecture you about what pro-life uh, mm -hmm. really means. But I, I would encourage all of you to really think about um, vaccinations. At, and hopefully this conversation has informed you, given you some confidence when you go in to have discussions with your physicians. Now you have a resource at the Lozier Institute where you can go get more information. You can get in touch with Dr. Prentice, uh, Dr. Lee. In fact, how can everybody get in touch with you all? Do you have Twitter, what, how do you, what's your primary way of getting out information? So there's actually on the Lozier website, there is a, um, I think there's a main email address yeah. that mm -hmm. they can yeah. click on. Yes. So that's going to be their best and fastest way. We have somebody 24 seven that monitors that, um, send, they can send a message. If they want to get us a direct message, please use that resource and we will respond as quickly as I can, I, we can with any specific questions and resources and even kind of more, you know, more intangible ethical questions that maybe don't have a clear cut, you know, response. We'd be happy to address any of those issues yeah. as well. So, yeah. So make sure you sign up for the Charlotte Lozier Institute email list, go to lozierinstitute.org, um, sign up. I think they also have a Facebook page. Um, they might have an Instagram page. I know SBA, Susan Anthony Thanks. does. Okay, I think so. So uh, yeah. make sure you, you, you check them out. And um, I think this would be a great discussion uh, to bring to your Students for Life group on campus or your Community Right to Life group or your Pro-Life Future group, because this is certainly an issue that's going to be talked about for the next several months. And it's an important, as Dr. Lee was saying earlier, this is an important opportunity for us to educate. Um, because a lot of folks, I mean, I know I've certainly turned heads at my doctor's office when talking about different uh, research methods and uh, drugs uh, and really educated, had to educate a lot of very um, accomplished physicians uh, about their research methodology because they just, this isn't discussed. It's kind of, you know, as Dr. Lee was saying, it's sort of lazy that sometimes they don't even know um, where they're deriving cell lines from when conducting research. So thank you, Dr. Prentice. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for getting on. I really appreciate your time today and helping us. Uh, make sure you look up LozierInstitute.org to stay in touch. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier in my little 
aside about why it's so important to vote for vote for pro-life candidates, we're going to have some major battles coming up um, when everything starts moving forward in Senate confirmation hearings for um, appointees to the Biden-Harris administration. And we're very, very concerned in the pro-life movement already about some of the names that have been floated for leadership positions in the administration, cabinet positions. Um, then chiefly, Javier Becerra has been named as uh, in, incoming President Biden. It's very hard for me to say that. Uh, his Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, is a former U.S. Congressman. He's Attorney General of California. He is the one prosecuting David Daleiden, trying to put David Daleiden in jail for exposing Planned Parenthood's human trafficking baby body parts scheme. Not going after Planned Parenthood, by the way, going after the journalists for exposing the dirty work that Planned Parenthood is doing. He is, has no connection to the medical community. He is a lawyer. He's an activist. He is, you know, he is their guy at Planned Parenthood. And they're very excited about him being named to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services because what we know what this will mean, this will mean increased funding for abortions, taxpayer-funded abortions, taxpayer-funded embryonic stem cell research, everything bad uh, that you can envision uh, that will be coming out of the Biden administration, most of it will be in starting right there at HHS. So make sure you sign our petition. Uh, go to studentsforlife.org slash um, defund Planned Parenthood PP, studentsforlifeaction.org slash stop Becerra. We've got a bunch of petitions going on um, right now that we're going to be sending to the U.S. Senate and demanding that U.S. Senators take action, stand up to Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and all of their radical uh, appointees to their administration. So the main uh, email, uh, the main website right now is studentslifeaction.org slash stop Becerra, B-E-C-E-R-R-A. So make sure you check that out. And we're going to have some marching orders coming down really soon on that. So thanks guys for tuning in. Make sure you share this episode uh, on social media. Send it to your parents. I know I'm going to be sending it to my mom as soon as we pu click publish. Bye guys.